Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Julian Prez and I am the Vice President of Risk Management and Regulatory Compliance at Dental Corp. Uh, I am honored and thrilled today to be here with uh, two fantastic, amazing uh, members of the dental profession. Uh, let me introduce them first is Dr. Howard Tonnenbaum, uh, who received his DDS from the University of Toronto in <clears throat> 1978 and completed his specialty in periodontology as well as a PhD in bone cell biology in 1982. That was followed by a two-year postdoc in Bethesda at the National Institute of Health. In addition to his degrees, Dr. Tonnenbaum has a fellowship from the Royal College of Dentists of Canada, as well as the International College of Dentists and the Academy of Dentistry International. Dr. Tonnenbaum is professor of periodontology and was head of that discipline for eight years at the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Toronto. Uh, he was also associate dean for biologic and diagnostic sciences for six years. Um, his biography is extremely impressive, um, but I'm going to jump to the most uh, uh, exciting part for me personally. Dr. Tannenbaum has the cumulative peer-reviewed research funding since 1987, exceeding $2 million, and has lectured internationally on several topics, including oral facial pain, cellular biology of bone, management of refractory periodontal disease, and he had one set of experiments carried out aboard the U.S. Space Shuttle by astronaut Senator John Glenn relating to the effects of microgravity of bone cell metabolism and bone formation and culture, and he's promised to talk a little bit uh, about that to us today. Um, my other esteemed guest today is Dr. Michael Glogauer, who's a clinical periodontist as well. He has private practice, and his website is omgperio.ca, and he's renowned in inflammation, immunology, and oral diseases. He's a professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, U of T, where his research over the past 25 years focuses on the mechanistic contributions and interplay between neutrophils and microbiome in oral and systematic health. He's the head of dentistry currently for University Health Network and chief of dental oncology at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. He has received awards in recognition of his research excellence and was recently named a fellow in the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. He's experienced in conducting clinical trials, particularly in collaboration with multinational pharma companies, gentlemen, Doctors, welcome, and thank you for being here with us this evening. Um, so excited. So, set the table a little bit. These are amazing times that we're living in, uh, challenging times. Um, and I think also, in a way, uh, a time of great opportunity uh, for, for society as a whole, for Canada, and for our profession of dentistry. Um, over the last couple of months, aerosols, the topic of aerosols, and, and our, our session today is called uh, Clearing the Air, Managing Aerosols in Dentistry, have become sort of a buzzword uh, larger than life. It, it's become an obsession of the profession. Um, I was hoping the two of you could, could explain to us, to our audience, um, a few things. So we're going to start with the basics. Let's start with uh, the most basic, what is an aerosol uh, fundamentally and, and what is an aerosol in the context of dentistry? Age before beauty, <laughs> Howie. Age before beauty, okay. okay. Well, an aerosol okay. obviously is, is generated, it's a bunch, it's particles, uh, liquid particles, solid particles uh, that can be generated uh, by coughing, uh, sneezing, but also of course, uh, uh, by aeros what we call aerosol generating procedures um, performed in the mouth. Uh, and in fact, in dentistry, we are probably like, we are the uh, profession that produces the highest level of aerosols of almost any other medically related uh, profession. And as a consequence, we've become concerned about it due to issues pertaining to uh, COVID. Um, the aerosol may hang in the air, it may spread from room to room, uh, possibly. Um, and uh, we're looking at issues to hopefully uh, mitigate problems that may be associated with aerosols that contain infective particles. And I think that's, that's a big concern of most regulatory authorities uh, at the moment, quite understandably. Right, and I, so I think, you know, and just to sort of build on that, really most of what we're gonna talk about tonight is the the risk that's associated with that aerosol plume or cloud that's generated that comes out of the mouth um, 
at, during our aerosol generating procedures. And so, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of this, we'll go through five or six or seven elements uh, that we can sort of control uh, as dentists to help really minimize the risk uh, to ourselves, our staff, and, uh, and, and, and our patients. And, you know, I know this is an incredibly stressful time for everybody. You know, we've, we've, had our, we've had our profession sort of grind to a halt uh, based on that the government and our regulatory agencies have basically said, you have to stop what you're doing. And um, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's a critical juncture in the profession of dentistry. I think, you know, we can talk about, um, you know, just before HIV, there was something called wet finger dentistry and HIV came along and that was a major turning point where um, sort of uh, PP, the, the, that was the initiation of PP into the field of dentistry. And that was a turning point and dentistry thrived after that. And there's, there's no doubt in my mind that um, this, is a, this is, a, is an important time point, as you've mentioned, Julian, but I think that there, uh, it's an opportunity for us to raise our game and raise the level of, of what we do in dentistry and how we do it. And, and I, I think, you know, more to Mike's point, um, you know, after HIV in particular, although interestingly not after SARS or H1N1 or even the Hong Kong flu, if anyone can remember that one. Um, we, ra we, we created this notion, this, this philosophical concept of um, uh, universal precautions because one doesn't know or one didn't know necessarily who might be infected with HIV. And so we decided, well, we're just going to presume everyone's infected with HIV. And Admittedly, it was seemed to be quite a um, heavy load to throw upon a dental practice at that time. Uh, but, you know, within a year or two, it became commonly accepted. And this is the way we manage patients now in an absolutely routine way. So I think what Mike and I are thinking of or, is that if there are changes to the way we deliver um, uh, oral health care, um, while it may seem daunting initially, uh, at some point it, it will just become part of, of routine, uh, routine management. And in fact, it'll bring us closer, if you will, to the model that's followed in, in, medic in medicine, particularly with regard to surgical and other interventional procedures, which when you think about it, dentistry, 99.9% um, .9 of the things we do are surgical of some sort, either hard tissue or soft tissue. And even uh, scaling and root planing is something that is interventional. So I'd like to talk, if possible, about some of the um, recent research that's be been done in aerosols, um, both both sort of the public non-clinical side, as well as anything that's more relevant maybe to the healthcare and dentistry profession. So I think most people um, who will familiar with an article uh, that came out a, two months ago and was probably pu uh, published about a month ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it discussed um, the um, sort of half-life and uh, uh, duration of COVID-19 on uh, multiple surfaces, but most importantly, in the air and aerosols. Um, could you talk a little bit about that research and, and what exactly? Yeah. Um, you know, this, it's interesting because uh, when we started looking into this, and, and Mike and I started to have conversations about this uh, early on, um, when we looked at some of the approaches that were being suggested for management, uh, or even whether or not we should manage aerosols, let's even go back farther, um, everyone seemed to be relying on a very important, and, I, and actually a well done study in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, what they found was that when they generated aerosols in a laboratory setting, uh, and that's critically important. They generated aerosols in a laboratory setting using something called a Goldberg uh, drum, which initially I thought was a tympanic sort of uh, instrument, but uh, it's not. It's used to generate aerosols in the laboratory. And then they would study um, how long these aerosols might stay suspended either within the drum and furthermore, they would take samples of the aerosols from this, this drum, place them on different surfaces, and try to look and see how long the viral particles remain viable. I don't like to use the word live because we're not quite sure how to describe 
viruses in terms of being living or not. Um, the, the issues associated with that though is that as well as, as, as neatly done as the laboratory work was, there are some unknowns. First of all, we, we don't understand because there's no detail as to how well they uh, practice procedures to identify viral RNA. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that they found viral RNA, COVID viral RNA, virtually everywhere uh, and uh, in all their samples. Uh, it, and they also tested for viral viability, um, although they did not show the data. Uh, they suggested that the viral, that there were viral particles that were capable of replicating within a cell culture. And they indicated that within, I guess, the drum environment, um, that it took about uh, three hours or so for the aerosol to settle. And so two questions uh, come to mind, or actually more. Uh, <laughs> one is, is the presence of viral RNA a de facto, uh, does it represent de facto proof that virus itself is present? And the answer is no. Um, and uh, furthermore, and it might be uh, it, helpful just if, if you explain quickly the difference between RNA and virus itself. I know many of the viewers will understand, but there may be a few who, who don't quite understand the distinction. And in the context of a I don't know if Mike wants virus. To take sure. So, I mean, what's happening is, is that the, the RNA is the key element within the viral, within the viral capsule that gets essentially it, with, injected into the cell which then allows um, the, the RNA essentially the, the allows the virus to hijack the the machinery within the cell to start making more and more virus uh, particles. Mm -hmm. And so, what, what's unique about this coronavirus, and it, it, particularly this SARS-CoV-2 virus, is that it's got quite a durable shell, which is the outside. And what this shell does, um, it actually has an ability to bind to a specific receptor on epithelial cells that happen to be high on the tongue, but really high on epithelial cells within the lung. And this allows, gives it the ability to inject itself into these cells, hijack the cell machine, the cells start to essentially become sick. And that creates this, um, this downward spiral where the lung becomes um, the immune system begins to attack elements of the lung, and that's where you get this fluid buildup within the lung. And right. so, you know, and so the, this key this key article that that Howie has you know has brought up the Van Dolman study really does everything in a laboratory setting with this Goldberg uh, apparatus. And so the virus particles are kept in a localized sealed container, and they're removed periodically to see how long they survive. This doesn't bear any resemblance to what's actually happening in the real world and certainly within a dental practice. Right. So that, that's the issue. And that's really what, uh, what bothered me. Not, not bo I, I can't, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean that the study bothered me. I, think as, I, I, I don't think I can overstate that the study itself uh, as a standalone was done well and their findings appear to be reliable. But that does not mean a priori that those findings can be extended to the clinical situation, which we like to call the real world situation. So the finding of RNA um, itself, uh, which is the in, on the inside of that, that, that protein coat that Mike was talking about, um, does not necessarily mean that you've got a viable virus product because the, vir the RNA itself isn't going to insert itself without, without the rest of the machinery of the virus. Uh, but they did show that there were infective particles. However, there were other studies, and one in particular that I'm, I, uh, I like, which was related to um, the assessment of naturally occurring aerosols uh, studied in the uh, treatment rooms from patients who were suffering from uh, COVID-19 infections. They were symptomatic, they were coughing, and, and so on. And so these investigators, uh, again, employ techniques to look for, because they're very sensitive, to look for viral RNA. And, uh, you know, as what we see is that a lot of people seem to equate viral RNA with virus. And I think you understand from what we're saying here is that you cannot equate it. And they know that and they knew that. And so what they then did was they then said, well, okay, we found all this viral RNA. It's under the 
under the patient's bed, it's on the air grates, it's on the window sills. Um, it, it was everywhere, viral RNA, uh, particularly on the air grates, the intake air grates of, of the room. But then they went several steps further and they said, well, you know, but we better we better demonstrate the presence of viral protein, that protein coat mm -hmm. or capsule that Mike was talking about. And um, my guess is they, uh, they initially started with one method to identify the viral coat, couldn't find any. And so they used two separate, very sensitive methods, which I won't bother elaborating upon uh, now, to look for the presence of viral protein. They found none. So that tells you that either their technique wasn't sensitive enough, which I doubt, um, but it does tell you that at least within that environment, there's no evidence they could not find viral protein. Um, now, you know, if there's a very, very low count of virus, I guess, you know, you have to admit that perhaps there's a sensitivity issue. So recognizing that, they did what the group with the Goldman drum did, and they took their air samples and um, they took surface samples and so on. Uh, I actually communicated with the authors about this and uh, put them again into cell culture. And they, they got virtually no viral replication. I think one of the samples prob possibly from a stainless steel surface, I'm not sure, because uh, they haven't completed everything yet. Um, they found virtually no viral growth in the cell culture. Um, and even when pressed, they said, well, I guess you might be able to say that maybe there's some live virus present. And so I put it to people, well, if you can't infect a culture, and now maybe it's not the best cell culture model, but they're using the same one that everyone else is using, the Vero 2 cell culture. If you can't infect a culture of cells with virus and get the virus to replicate, in a system where there's no immune system and it's it's absolutely ideal for viral growth, then that tells you something about the uh, danger level, if you will, of mm -hmm. the uh, samples that they took. I mean, if you can't infect a culture, how are you going to infect a human being? So well, I think we're left with this. There is some live virus there. They said there's some detectable, perhaps, mm -hmm. but, but very, uh, very minor. Right. And so I think the take the take home message, you know, and, and there are not, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to be part of a number of uh, a, a scientific groups who are investigating this. And one in particular led by Ian First um, is doing inc incredible work, really scouring the database and speaking to experts. And I think, you know, following through the take home message of, of what Howie and those of us looking at the literature, it's clear that, that there's really no evidence that COVID is an actual airborne pathogen. And by that mean, by, by that we mean that there's no evidence that the live, that, that there's live virus within the aerosols through an experimental sampling that can actually uh, induce the disease. And we're talking about aerosols here. And so I think it's important for us to remember this as we go forward, because we're going to talk about a lot of things about how we manage and control the, air, uh, the, the aerosols and, and the plumes, which really is the key element uh, that, that put, is putting us all at risk. But, but I think it's important think, we, we keep this in the, in the background that we remember this. Yeah. I think we also have to remember, uh, I agree 110% with what Mike's saying. Can you agree 110%? Uh, but I, I agree 100% with Mike. Um, but we also understand that even the group in Nebraska found something, and we know that in the dental environment, there, it's a massive generation of aerosol versus even a COVID patient's room. And, you know, there are other, other experiments that are going to be coming down the line. Maybe they're going to use more um, uh, uh, forgiving cell culture models that may allow uh, for viral replication that we're not seeing now. So it's not to say that there is absolutely no possibility of live virus being on any surface or in the air, but the preponderance of the evidence that we have now suggests rather strongly that if there is virus there, there's not a lot. So then let's talk for a minute about just um, the different modes of transmission um, when you're dealing with upper respiratory infections like uh, the SARS virus, SARS-CoV-2. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about airborne and aerosol, and I think the two get conflated sometimes because maybe airborne is, is 
beyond air, so just exhaling when I'm breathing. Um, there are tiny little droplets of humidity coming out of my lungs um, and with some extremely uh, contagious um, uh, viruses, that might be an issue. Um, in dentistry, you deal with the aerosol, which is not new, but is, is obviously the, the topic of the month. Uh, what are the other modes you would te technically see and should we be worried about those when it comes to COVID-19? Now, uh, splatter, um, uh, fomite, what, what, are, what are those and, and, and how uh, do they relate to aerosol, just to give us sort of the full picture? Right. So, so the, the key element is this, is that this aerosol, this plume is generated. Uh, you've got, and really the key, the key pro, uh, sort of vector is that really droplets which carry m multiple numbers of viral particles in them uh, would settle within a minute or so onto surfaces. And it's the trans, then us as, as our patients, anyone coming into contact with that surface, touching it with their hands, transferring it to their muc mucous membranes on their face, their eyes, their nose, their mouth. That is the predominant uh, method whereby this virus is becoming, be, becomes an infectious agent. It right? becomes an issue for, for the, the, the transmission element, the transmission step. And so um, that, that, is, that, that is the critical element. And so that's why PPE is such an important element because that's what's going to protect. I mean, there was a study that came out that showed that the major risk to healthcare workers and when you have breakdowns in hospitals is, is often at the PP element. And, and it's really, it's the removal of, it's the danger that occurs at people improperly uh, doffing their PPE, where a significant danger is associated for the, and that's where the, the virus gets transferred. And I think it's important that we all recognize that because in a, you know, in a few minutes we'll be talking about PPE. Yeah. And but of course, that's typically these, and, and there's good evidence for this, but that's typically all in um, settings like the ICU, um, eMERGE settings, uh, general internal medicine, respirology, where you literally are dealing with uh, severe illness with uh, severely infected patients. And indeed, um, doffing is apparently the time when um, individuals, uh, individual clinicians um, may infect themselves. And, uh, in the dental setting, I don't know how important that's going to be, but we need to assume this universal precautions just like we have for everything else. And so appropriate doffing, at least, the taking off of the uh, PPE is, um, is clearly important. I think uh, I definitely want to circle back and talk about doffing, um, and I, I'm actually uh, very curious to know about what kind of training um, education is provided in hospital settings when it comes to PPE. Um, before we get there, and we will get there, because um, I think that's from a safety perspective one of the most important things we can talk about, um, I just want to sort of uh, wrap up our conversation on aerosols. Um, in sort of theoretically, before we move into um, what are some of the effective ways, assuming without perhaps knowing scientifically at this point that aerosols can uh, lead to transmission of COVID-19, what are some effective ways we can minimize the risk to uh, frontline healthcare workers like dental assistants, hygienists, and dentists? So um, it sounds like the research so far is inconclusive, but it's ongoing with regards to whether an aerosolized particle of COVID-19 can actually um, uh, invade a cell and create infection. Um, has, has, and, and, and so far that's been studied either in hospitals or in a clinical environment. Are there any studies in dentistry on how aerosols behave when it comes to the use of high-speed hand instruments, when it comes to the, uh, the use of uh, profi jets or ultrasonic uh, scalers? Well, so there is, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Howie. Oh, all right. Um, I mean, there, there's, there is good evidence that the use of high volume suction uh, will reduce, uh, uh, let's say, bacteria-laden aerosols. There, there, there are several studies looking at bacteria, and I don't think it's much of a stretch to uh, to, to include viral, uh, viral issues um, because the aerosol behaves as an aerosol irrespective of whether there's bacteria in it or um, viral particles. And studies using looking at bacterial 
um, aerosols have shown that high speed suction is a very good way of reducing uh, aerosol related contamination. Pre rinses, uh, when you're talking about bacteria, pre rinses with chlorhexidine, for example, have also been shown to reduce um, bacterial aerosols. I don't think we have as good data with respect to viral contamination, but if you have an agent that kills virus topically, like hydrogen peroxide, um, or other, uh, there are some other agents that are being uh, uh, studied, Mike knows a lot about those. Um, there's no reason to believe that uh, by uh, rinsing uh, that you could not reduce the viral load um, within, within an aerosol. And there are other measures, of course. Right, and so just, to take a half a step back. So, you know, there was a paper by Bennett in the British Dental Journal where they looked at, uh, and they went to six different dental practices and they used some, some good sophisticated devices to pick up microbe, uh, to pick up, to grow oral streptococci out of aerosols. And what they showed very interestingly is that um, whether it was scaling root planing, whether with ultrasonics or using a high speed handpiece, there was a window of time in every appointment where the aerosols were quite significant, but to about 15 to 30 minutes um, after that peak aerosol yeah. generation, there was no detectable microbial aerosol. And I, I think this is, this is important because, you know, what it's telling us, if we go back to this, again, the aerosol plume with the virus that we generate, is it's really the droplets that are settling. And in this study, at least for the, at least for the bacteria, they're settling within 30 minutes and that there was no detectable bacteria in the aerosols at that point. Now, viruses may be a little bit different, but I think this is an important study because it yeah. does help us understand what's happening during dental appointments. And, you know, for example, there was about a 15 minute period when a, when a high speed was used in that one hour appointment where there was that peak. But shortly thereafter, there was no more microbial uh, sort of droplets being being an issue within the, within the... Within and I would say uh, that, you know, when you consider the... Um, sort of the fluid mechanics and the airflow mechanics of aerosols, whether it's back contains bacteria or virus, it's going to be the, 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 the actual behavior of the aerosol is unchanged. So the data that are, that show this rapid settling um, would seem to support the notion, they must support the notion that, uh, that whether it's bacteria or virus in those droplets, they're going to settle at the same rate. Yeah, th that that certainly uh, makes sense to me. Um, and you know, so fifteen to thirty minutes—that's not a number that I I have been have had in my head. I've had numbers like um, two or three or four hours, and you know, I, I've been seeing this table of um, uh, sort of aerosol settling times. Can you talk about uh, you know, like I, I feel like you've just mentioned one study where aerosol settling times were discussed in the context of dentistry, but there seems to be a broader discussion that some of the regulatory bodies are having that revolves around, um, you know, um, the CDC's guidance. Um, I don't know if you guys can talk a little bit about, I'm sure you're aware of, of the conversation and research that, that's been done in that area. So, uh, so this is what I would say on that, is that, um, you know, for, for the dental regulatory agencies in the CDC, for example, their job is to protect the public. And there is an unknown, we, we, you know, we, we, here's a paper on microbial settling. Um, there may be imperfections in our inability to detect virus in the air. And I think that it's, they're understandably hesitant to, to proceed without um, doing, erring on the side of caution. At least some mm -hmm. of them, some people want to err on the side of caution, and I can completely understand that. And so this, the idea is, is that the the best way to eliminate these aerosols is to turn over the air in the clinical space, um, essentially twelve times. And so don't forget, we're talking also about protection of ourselves. Yeah, as they'll, and which by the way protects yeah. the public, right? right. I mean. Um, we, as a profession, uh, we are at risk for, we, we have the highest incidence of upper respiratory tract infection. And if you look at serology, uh, respiratory syncytial virus or other respiratory viruses, we've got, we've got antibodies to those things much more than other, other professions. So we're protecting ourselves too against a potential uh, problem. And again, 
you know, I, I totally understand trying to err on the side, at least of caution. Um, however, at the same time, I think if, if you rely on certain data, and in particular the New England Journal of Medicine paper, um, you're going to come away with a conclusion that you need about a three hour period of time for all the viral particles, to, or the, sorry, the aerosol uh, to settle, which is not necessarily the case. And furthermore, the, the, um, another complicating factor is the infectivity of the aerosol itself. But let's presume that the aerosol is an issue, or let's, let's look at this another way. We're not really worried about air exchange. We're not really worried about aerosol. What we're worried about is creating an environment that is as safe as possible in this new age um, for us as clinicians, our hygienists, our other staff. Um, there's all sorts of layers of issues there with regard to staff and hygienists, but um, we're trying to create conditions that are as safe as is humanly possible now, but which also do not make it impossible to practice dentistry. Right. And, and what are the things that one can do? And so just focusing on, let's say, oh, let's close the room for three hours or, or let's put in an industrial strength uh, HVAC. Um, the goal isn't so much air exchange as it is reducing the risk for infection. In order to do that, we have several things at our disposal that we can do, which will not only benefit us, I think, in terms of reducing the risk, even if Mike and I are saying, well, we don't really know how much viral activity there really is in an aerosol, but let's presume that there could be. Um, and uh, we can reduce the risk with several approach, using several easy to uh, adopt approaches, I would say, um, that have would been shown in the literature to lead to a situation where you can be much more uh, satisfied that you're dealing with a much safer um, environment right. so for I, I did, the individual. Right. So I just I just want to sort of clarify my my viewpoint on this. And again, this is this is it's that with twelve air changes in a space, you can remove ninety nine point nine plus percent of all the all the air and therefore all the virus particles that may or may not be present in the space. So we're talking about mitigating risk. Um, you know. There are certain areas where the DRAs, the dental regulatory authorities, all converge. Um, I, we've talked about a couple of them already. We talked about uh, pre-procedural um, uh, mal uh, mouth rinses. Um, so what if the procedure is 20, 30 minutes, um, you know, it, it, and, and the patient begins to salivate or, you know, they've taken a, a bite wing x-ray and that's sort of triggered the salivation uh, reflex. Do you think that there's, is it just a one time and then you're done uh, mechanism or do you think there's an opportunity to um, repeat that throughout a, a longer procedure to try to cut down on the virus that's in the mouth so that if aerosol escapes, it's not carrying virus? Well, it may depend on what you're doing. For one thing, if you're doing surgery and you start having somebody rinse with peroxide, you're going to have a mouthful of bubbles. Um, <laughs> you also have to recognize you are using high speed suction with a lot of water hopefully sterile water, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, you know, the second, you know, we've probably already diluted it by knocking down maybe the resident bugs that are there. I don't know that one has to have people re-rinse. If you're using a rubber dam, I suppose you could flood the area with some sort of peroxide rinse. Um, there's nothing wrong. If you have the opportunity to have somebody re-rinse for, for whatever, uh, several seconds or a minute or 30 seconds, um, that might help. Um, it wouldn't hurt. Right. It might so? I, I don't know what you so you know. So we just uh, one of the one of the CHR grants we just submitted today was actually to ask, answer this very question, which is we're testing two different antiviral rinses, and what we're doing is we're having we're having COVID positive patients. Um, we're taking a baseline uh, oral a salivary sample to know what their baseline oral viral load is, and then we're having them rinse with the antibacterial uh, antiviral rinse. And then we're taking a sample at 15 minutes, half an hour, one hour, two hours, and four hours. And what that's going to—that's what what that's going to tell us, on average, in this large in this population of patients, how quickly does the virus come back? And obviously, there'll be some variability in the stage, but it'll give us a sense of is there value 
in having somebody rinse more than one time. But the other thing is, and I think this is the exciting part, is, is that if this antiviral rinse works, one of the ways you may be able to cut down on transmission and cut down on droplets um, and transmissible droplets is, in, you know, we have people wash their hands. But if we can show that at two hours or at four hours, you've knocked down the viral, you still knock down the viral low by 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, we can have mouth rinsing the equivalent of hand washing. Mm -hmm. and, and that and you would know, be Mike, like, that's not even, sorry, that's not even necessarily just for transmissibility. You, you like almost wonder how that affects, right. Right, that because if you can, actual infection. Right, because what that could do is, is that, uh, the one thing about SARS-CoV-2 is, is that it starts in the upper airway, which is, mm -hmm. and it ends up in the lower airway. And so you have to have that transmission. And so if there's a way, so yes, in theory, it could be a, it could be a therapeutic or preventative agent, but yeah, also it has relevance to the dental practice by de that, that. So I think you're right, Julian. Step number one is controlling the aerosol plume. And number one is to minimize the viral content by having a pre-procedural rinse. And then, you know, hopefully this research will show us which, um, how often you have to have somebody rinse. So I, I, think, I think that's level one. Certainly any restorative procedure, rubber dam. Rubber dam is, is the standard and that will, that's another way of minimizing the viral load. I'd like to pick both of your brains and, and sort of uh, understand your experiences within a hospital of, um, you know, just, Getting back to the topic we left off a while ago, which is PPE and the risk that you have donning and doffing, you know, is there any different training you receive, uh, dentists would receive um, uh, by virtue yes. of working in a hospital? Yeah, it's um, our hospital and I presume UHN, although I think the UHN sometimes sends people over to us. It just depends on, I think, numbers of people taking the classes, but we actually have uh, ongoing training sessions for uh, the use of PPE in person. It's about an hour when you go in to do this, this course. Um, in addition, when you, when you apply for reappointment, we also have training videos that you must watch, but with examinations at the end. And I'll be perfectly frank, uh, when, I, uh, when I did the first, uh, uh, it, there's a little test at the end, and I failed the first test because I missed a couple of questions. You know, it's fascinating because this is not something we've done uh, historically. And so I had to go back and take another look and I go, oh, right. Okay. And uh, so it really did help uh, in terms of uh, at least training me and, and the people in our department who are slowly trickling through the, um, the training program too. So don't forget, they've all done these video training sessions with tests and the videos are always available by the way too. And they're taking these courses or, or not courses, but training sessions that are being offered. Right. And, and so, and, that's important. And, and, you know, um, you can find these videos online. In fact, Julian, you know, the Alberta, the Alberta document that just came out a few hours ago, there are actually links in that to donning and doffing that, you know, so videos are available online as how we said at all the hospitals, we get a refresher every single year. Uh, on and, and including in person, yeah. Um, as well as, uh, you know, if you, if they, th there are times when they'll just say, it's time to take the video, to, to do the video again, literally. So three months from now, I might get a notice that I must review this video again. And it's recorded. They know that I've reviewed it. But, you know, uh, so, and it's important. And going into the hospital aspect, you know, as soon as this all came down, the hospital came to our department and said, here for your three, for three of your surgical ops, here they moved in these massive HEPA units and they said, you've got to run them. And afterwards you've got to leave it for 30 minutes running before you can go back in there. So it's not like we're just, you know, the, the hospital, you know, the, this, is this is how hospitals are run. And I think, you know, th that, that, that's the wake up call that, you know, this is, we've got to sort of move things up to the next, next level. Yeah, we, we didn't get any, we got nothing. <laughs> You know, in terms of, of um, the, the, the training, I'm interested as well in just um, how is uh, patient safety dealt with? Is there like, um, you know, is the, is the culture of patient safety any, any different or is there sort of a, a, like, I'm familiar with a lot of hospitals have patient, you know, safety consultants. 
is there is that woven into how oh, dental care is provided oh, with absolutely product? even 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 in dentistry and the reason i say even is because you know we're not necessarily always considered as part of the the overall um, clinical operation of a hospital um we like to think we're important uh but even with dentistry there are people looking over our shoulders who are making sure that um, adverse events that occur, if they should occur, are investigated thoroughly with regard to patient safety. So patient safety is of paramount importance in the hospital, but I put it to you that as important as patient safety is, so is our safety. And in fact, we're the ones who are constantly exposed to these sorts of environments. A patient is only there for an hour or two. So mm -hmm. really think about it in terms of our own health too, and the health mm -hmm. of our employees. But, and I think I think that's a that's a good that's an important point to make. So I know I've just sort of was sent a, a survey of 500 Green Shield Canada Health Benefit Plan members, and mm -hmm. they basically showed that you know 60 good news 62 percent are anxious and completely willing to go back to their dentist. 25 mm -hmm. percent said no, they were not going back to their dentist. And so all these things we're discussing, mm -hmm. there's the at, we have to recognize we may be ready to go back. It's questionable about whether all our staff feel safe, but there's a right. quarter of one in four patients is not ready to come back because we have to build confidence in them that we know what we're doing and that we're up to it in, in to making sure that we're able to protect them. Yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, speaking a little bit on behalf of uh, what Demo Corp has been doing, you know, um, just because I think it, it, it's actually quite relevant. It's, we've realized very quickly that one of the biggest challenges to getting back to work would be um, that staff was, you know, concerned about their own health and safety and quite, quite rightfully so, given everything that's been in the news and in the media. Um, and so, you know, the, the question of aerosols has obviously loomed large over the profession recently, but, you know, a lot of the research that I've done has shown as well that, quite frankly, you know, patient screening is really where it starts. Mm -hmm. you know, to the extent that you can reduce having anyone in the practice who has symptoms recently um, that are related to, you know, the COVID-19 symptoms, people who have traveled to hot spots, um, you know, screening out uh, patients who live with someone who has recently had a flu or a common cold or, um, you know, any other, even gastro uh, uh, upset all of these things now are, are associated with COVID-19. And so we're really working hard on minimizing the people who come into the practice, also encouraging staff um, that, to be honest and if they're not feeling well, not to come in, right? So, so, so I, I want to, so I, I think you're hundred percent correct and screening is critical, but I want to tell you about an anecdote I heard today, mm -hmm. which is a family, a, a, a family member of one of my dental assistants. Mm -hmm. It tells the story of that, his, his uncle, mm -hmm. 55 years old, completely healthy, passed away from COVID. Mm -hmm. where, where did he get it from? His wife, who's a nurse, mm -hmm. completely asymptomatic. And yep. has no, and yeah. the reason, and so screening, absolutely critical, can minimize, mitigate a lot of the risk. However, what we're starting to learn about this virus, and I'm sure everyone's starting to hear it, is that the problem is the asymptomatic patients. I, and I know Howie and I have discussed this, uh, but we live in a world where there are asymptomatic carriers who are yes. going to pass it on. And hence, it comes back to universal precautions and we, yep. we have to assume, right? Yeah, my point is that they may be, you know, we call them asymptomatic. Uh, my feeling is that they may be walking around with a headache and think, oh, I just don't feel so good today. Uh, but they may well have a fever. So screening is incredibly important, even for temperature. Um, I don't know about travel to hotspots anymore because the whole world is a hotspot. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if, tra we're not even asking about travel anymore at the, at the hospital when people come in um, to uh, when they pass through our- uh, We have to remember screen. we have a national audience here. So there, there are people who live in, in towns, um, you know, we're all in Toronto, but we have people who live in towns where there's literally zero cases um, you know, circulating. And so for them, it's still a very re uh, relevant question. And the other thing that we're also doing is when patients come into the practice, regardless, because we understand that there's pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, perisymptomatic transmission, that our, you know, our greeters are, you know, um, <clears throat> screening the patient again in case there's a temperature, our staff is screening, but they're also wearing PPE 
um, and we're also encouraging social distancing, you know, so um, uh, amongst staff, <clears throat> amongst the patients, patients, um, you know, are being provided if necessary, uh, you know, class one, and they're also, we've created a virtual um, uh, waiting room so that patients aren't in the office, right? So, you know, if, if uh, contagion is a matter of opportunity, you cut down the opportunity, you know, to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. slices, to the point where you get to the clinical and we talked about all of those those tips um and obviously you know there's the sky is the limit when it comes to how much you want to implement in terms of engineering yeah. well i think you know in that regard um we also mentioned mike and i were talking about this too you're not just screening patients you're screening your staff when they come in that's too that, that's and, right you know, i mean you can even do temperature checks more than once a day if you want to in your staff but uh, something also comes to mind that we're all striving for somehow this perfection, this, this elimination in, in toto of, of any potential risk for um, cross-contamination. And, and I don't know who said this, but I've heard this many times recently, and in, which says that perfection is the enemy of the good. Right, and that's right. So, we, we are operating on the best knowledge we have. We can mitigate as best as we can. We will never null or zero the risk, nor, do, nor should we even aim for that because it's just gonna hobble the whole profession. We will never get there. And, uh, but, we, but there are things that we, I think that we can recommend um, that are doable, will be part of regular uh, routine universal precautions now. It's just another layer but it'll put us ahead of the curve, frankly, so that at the next peak or the next viral uh, new virus, we're not gonna close down. And they're drilling above my head. Is, are you hearing any of that? <laughs> we told them not to, uh, but they're actually carrying on construction above my head. <laughs> and they're creating well, aerosol. Be an service then. Um, so I, I'd like to just end maybe, um, a, a lot of dentists now, dental staff, are feeling, you know, uh, rightfully so, overwhelmed by a number of things. Some of them are concerned about health and safety. Others are concerned about the economic burden of rising to meet the the requirements um, that have been put in place recently. Um, you know, we have independent dentists who are tuning in, who are concerned about you know the affordability of their practice. Um, you know, there are requirements to wear PPE that is simply not available. And I was just wondering if maybe we can end on a positive note um, in terms of, you know, just acknowledging a lot of the things that um, we are able to do, um, you know, without necessarily uh, uh, breaking the bank or making dentistry so expensive or so intimidating that it's inaccessible to, you know, different populations of, of patients. I don't know if there's, if there's a couple of things that, you know, you guys want to close on in terms of maybe the research and what we're going to learn or, or antibody studies and, and how those are going to help dentistry. And uh, we'll, we'll call it an evening and, and, and um, uh, it's been over an hour. So I want to be uh, mindful of everybody's time. <laughs> oh, so like, I'll, I'll there's, sort there's of... something I'd like to say, uh, you know, we're very scared of COVID, right? First of all, we've said over and over again, COVID is not just the only, is not the only issue. Let me remind you that the, the actual mortality percent. Although uh, there's some people talking about 1.3% now. But if you look at SARS, it was 9.6%. MERS was 34%. Uh, but yet, we're, it's still much higher. The risk for COVID-related death is still much, much higher than, let's say, influenza death. But we're still not dealing with something like before triple, uh, triple therapy came about, HIV used to be a, a death sentence. No longer is it a death sentence. So if we can mitigate the risk and also develop treatments. And I'm not necessarily hanging on a vaccine for this. I think, you know, things are gonna be just just fine. And I think we can make some, you know, recommendations, suggestions um, that should also assuage the concerns of our regulatory bodies. And after all, they're not necessarily, again, they're not focusing on, you have to have X air exchanges, no. What they're focusing on is how do I get to a position where I've minimized risk to the best degree possible. Now that does include air exchanges, 
it include and may include other things that we can yeah. do. And I, I don't know if you want, you know, us to sort of talk about what are some of the things that we think are going to be become part of, of uh, dental care from here on in. I mean, we may have to leave that for another conversation, but, you know, in terms of the, the research that's going on and, and, and um, you know, it sounds like Michael, you, you've got a, a few projects on the go, maybe some of the information that, that will become clear and, and hopefully guide us into the future. So that we're making decisions based on evidence. So I'm not going to have a hard time leaving on a positive note because I can tell <laughs> that. Um, th number one, I start off. So um, I, I have been in contact and have been associated with so many people in this profession who are unbelievably bright. I mentioned um, this, the scientific table that's headed by Ian First, which has an incredible uh, number of extremely intelligent and thoughtful uh, dental clinicians who, have, who are scouring the literature to come up with and are, are coming up with recommendations after speaking to experts that really I think are going to save this profession and are going to make it very uh, clear the way forward. And I, I'm, you know, I, I think they're sh we're sharing this information with the right people so that the right decisions can be made by the various dental regulatory bodies. That's number one. Number two, um, I've mentioned there the research that's going on, whether it's looking at antiviral rinses that are going to help, that, that are, can have significant benefit. When we're talking about having novel ways of diagnosing. So, you know, it used to be all nasal swabs, but now we know it's saliva and perhaps it's cells in saliva that don't require PCR, which is a study we're doing. Uh, the, the, the number of, so let me give you an example. CHR just came out, today was the submission, which is the major funding agency for dental, for, for medical health research in Canada. They, they, they gave about a week and a half ago, they made an announcement for grants. They received 2,500 grants, which were written in the last that's week and a half, which is just, great. that's an incredible amount. So that's entire, the entire research uh, agency of Canada, the entire research body of Canada has literally like a big Titanic just changed direction in order to almost entirely focus on this disease. There is incredible hope and that's just Canada, not talking about the rest of the world, which is, is even greater. Mm -hmm. So the future, I think the future is bright. I know people are quite concerned and nervous because it's the unknown, but if I could just reassure everybody that the brightest minds in Canada and the brightest minds all over the world in dentistry and in healthcare in general are focused on these issues. And that's why I believe whether it's a year from now, two years, things will be back to a new normal and we will be seeing our patients and we'll, be, we'll all be better off for it. And you know, with HIV, one of the things about HIV, all, this, all these research funds poured into study of the immune system and that had spinoffs for all sorts of and so I I'm not sure I hear Mike. But, uh, we uh, I think we might be losing him. I, I'm Mike. We lost you for a second there, um, but it, it was a very positive note to end on. So um, I just want to thank you both. Uh, I know you're super busy, um, and it was a pleasure speaking with you this this evening. As I sign off, I just want to say on behalf of Dental Corp that I appreciate everybody who 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 logged in. Um, you know, I. Uh, on, I'm honored to work it, with the dental profession um, as a risk manager and, and uh, director of compliance and as a lawyer for Dental Corp. Um, it's a pleasure speaking with all of uh, uh, the bright minds who are out there doing this research. Um, and, and I'd like to say that it's exciting to hear that there is all of this research that is um, being conducted and that soon you know, we'll have a lot more information. There'll be a lot more evidence on um, guiding us on, on how to effectively promote the safety of not only our patients, but our staff and ourselves. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing profession with, with amazing people, with highly talented, inventive, um, uh, innovative uh, doctors and, and business people. And I know that we will come out of this stronger. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's always important for everyone to stay up to date, to understand the evidence, um, and to share, you know, um, in this uh, market of ideas so that we're all stronger um, and, and hopefully that we can plan to come out of this as we did with the previous um, crises that we've discussed, uh, a more resilient and um, prosperous uh, healthcare profession. So 
thank you again, everybody who's joined. Um, thank you, Dr. Tannenbaum. Thank you, Dr. Glogauer. Um, I hope you both have wonderful evenings, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you.